In 1979, a plane would approach the edge of the world, an area that planes usually stay away from. After arriving to the Antarctic landscape, this commercial flight with 257 people would seemingly vanish into thin air, disappearing into the untouched mountains of Antarctica. Completely far away from the original course, this disappearance would almost instantly spark a widespread panic, becoming one of the most confusing and deadly aviation disasters in history. Air New Zealand Flight 901 was a sightseeing flight for tourists that wanted to view the beautiful Antarctic landscapes. It was a successful and popular attraction among curious people. The flight would cross the ocean, loop around what's known as McMurdo Sound to take pictures of the landscape in Mount Erebus, and then head back home safely without landing. However, there were more than a few problems with this flight. Since the flight was over Antarctica, if the plane malfunctioned or needed to emergency land anywhere, there would be zero available stops. In addition, McMurdo Sound is absolutely freezing. If the plane flew through it normally, the flaps would entirely freeze up due to the cold winds. So, to prevent this, the plane has to fly at a much faster speed through the area. To top it all off, this would also be the first time that the Captain Jim Collins and the First Flight Officer Gregory Mark Cassine had ever flown this route. Their only training in this area was a 45-minute DC-10 flight simulator session to review simple navigation and flight instruments. However, this does not change the fact that Jim and Gregory were still extremely skilled pilots. Both men had a respectable amount of flight hours in their time as pilots. Regardless though, the most threatening issue in this situation was actually not any of these things. Instead, it was with the plane itself, more specifically the plane's route. You see, the original route for the Antarctic sightseeing flights wasn't actually McMurdo Sound. Instead, it actually used to be directly above the top of Mount Erebus, a 12,000 foot high active volcano. There weren't really any problems with the Mount Erebus route, but regardless, in 1978, a year before the disaster, everything would change, because the plane received a new computer for navigation. So, as the Mount Erebus flying route was being transcribed onto the new computer, a tiny, seemingly insignificant coordinate change was entered incorrectly into the new computer. It was incorrectly entered as 164 degrees instead of 166 degrees. This small change in coordinates would simply put the flight path over a McMurdo Sound. Now, this wouldn't be a problem yet, because all the pilots that realized this change simply assumed this was because flying over some water is ultimately safer than flying over an active volcano. They also assumed that flying this route would allow them to drop to a much lower altitude for a better sightseeing experience, on par with the height of the volcano. So, they started flying the McMurdo route almost every time at a much lower altitude for better sightseeing. At this point, everything seemed to be going well, and tourist flights were booming in popularity. People from all over the world would come to experience a flight to a place that most people had never even seen before. However, just two weeks before the disaster on November 14th, 1979, a captain finally realized this discrepancy in the coordinates. After doing checks before his flight, he realized that the original route was actually over Mount Erebus. So, naturally, the captain simply reported his findings to an officer on the 14th and went about his flight. After almost two weeks of no change, finally, on the 27th, a day before Jim Collins and Gregory's flight, the navigation officers misunderstood the other captain's report, and ended up moving the route back over Mount Erebus. Now, this normally wouldn't be that much of a big deal. In a normal case, everyone would improvise and figure out a new route accordingly. But the real issue here again is that Jim and Gregory had never flown this route before. Their only understanding of the route is that they have to fly through McMurdo Sound at a lower altitude for sightseeing. But now that the route was switched back to Mount Erebus, if they were to fly at a low altitude here, well, that would unfortunately put them on a collision course with Mount Erebus. Now, there's a simple solution to all of this. All that needs to happen is that those that know about the flight path change just simply have to tell Jim and Gregory that the flight was changed, and tell them to fly at a much higher altitude over Mount Erebus. Well, the problem with this is that the officers that received the report originally received it at 1 in the morning, only roughly 7 hours before Jim's flight would depart. So at this point, when Jim and the rest of the flight crew woke up for their early morning flight, they were not told a single piece of information about the route change. They woke up that morning ready to fly through McMurdo Sound. So finally, when Air New Zealand Flight 901 set off for Antarctica on November 28th, 
nobody on the plane knew that they were actually on a flight path directly into the side of Mount Erebus. As the plane flew towards Antarctica, everything seemed to be going smoothly. The plane itself was performing fine and everybody aboard was excited to see this frozen mystery continent. The forecast of weather for the McMurdo area given to the flight crew was a light wind with snowfall and an overcast layer of clouds at around 3,500 feet. An overcast layer of clouds is described as a sky that is 100% completely covered in clouds. However, the weather would prove to be much more problematic later on. Now, as the plane would get closer to the area, they would connect and talk to the air traffic control station located in McMurdo. The officers there would guide the flight around the Antarctic weather accordingly. The traffic control station would describe that the weather for the area was actually a low overcast at around 2,000 feet with some snow covering the area. But luckily, below 2,000 feet, visibility would still be fine for sightseeing. However, the pilots for the flight would go on record saying that this didn't sound very promising. Regardless though, as the flight got closer to McMurdo again, the guys at the air traffic control station offered to guide the flight even lower. Lower to a height of 1,500 feet once they get within 40 miles of the station. So they waited, and flew closer and closer to the Mount Erebus area. And finally, as the flight reached the Mount Erebus area, the plane began to descend from 18,000 feet into the clouds. Since low overcast was at such a low height of 2,000 feet, Jim decided to descend under the clouds so the passengers can see the landscapes and so he can see where they are. However, this decision was actually against the minimum flight height set for the route. The minimum and lowest they were technically allowed to fly was 6,000 feet. But it also wasn't uncommon for pilots to safely descend under the minimum set height for a better sightseeing experience and for situational needs. That said, they started to descend. The pilots began orbiting down in a circle-like shape to 6,000 feet, but things would become very tricky from here, as now they were in the thick of the clouds and the thick of the snow. After circling, the pilots then took an oval-like shape descent to get a new approach on the area. They continued to descend even further to the desired height of 2,000 feet so they can get a grasp of where they were. Still in the clouds, however, they would now be in a very dangerous situation, because what they didn't know is that there was no hope of getting any visibility of the area from this point on. They kept descending through so many clouds until they reached a very dangerous area, and at about 1,500 feet, they hit a sector whiteout. A sector whiteout is a weather phenomenon in Antarctica where a flat snow-covered surface blends with an overcast sky, making it nearly impossible to distinguish features of the landscape. This makes for a landscape of no shadows, no features, and pretty much zero visibility due to the snow. This would make it impossible for the pilots to determine where they were, and whether or not they were in McMurdo Sound. As this was happening, however, for some reason, the pilots were also losing signal to the McMurdo area. The officers there would come in and out of signal sometimes until the signal was completely lost. At this point, they were now headed directly towards Mount Erebus, and the flight engineer was starting to become concerned as to where they were. The clouds were thick, and it was hard to see what was going on, and they couldn't see anything that would remotely resemble the McMurdo Sound area. At this point, the crew fully believed that they were over the ice-covered ocean of McMurdo Sound, so they continued to fly straight head-on. But finally, the flight engineer would ask nervously where Mount Erebus was in relation to the plane. The sightseeing guide Peter assumed it was 25 miles to the left, but they were all ultimately unsure of where they were. Jim said that the conditions were not looking good at all, and they were all entirely confused as to what was happening. As they flew closer and closer towards Mount Erebus, they would become very uncertain. The engineer stated, quote, that he did not like this, but finally they figured that they would climb out of this as they were unsure as to what was happening. Gregory told Jim that he could turn right, that there would be nothing there if he wanted to do a 180 degrees turn away from the area. And Jim said negative. And to everyone's surprise, the emergency ground proximity warning system beeped loudly a warning to the crew that they were only 500 feet above the mountain. But unfortunately, this would be far too little time to pull the plane up, as they only had six seconds before the plane would crash into the side of the mountain. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. 
at 12.50 p.m., five minutes after the last radio contact with McMurdo Station, Air New Zealand Flight 901 crashed into the side of Mount Erebus at 404 kilometers per hour, killing all 257 passengers upon impact. This was the footage of the inside of the cabin five minutes before the plane entered the thick layer of clouds. As soon as they entered the clouds, nobody on board had any idea of what was happening. After the crash, however, McMurdo Station continued to try contacting the flight as they hadn't been in contact for a good while, but they wouldn't receive a single response. Even after they were scheduled to arrive back in Auckland, New Zealand, there was not a single radio transmission of the flight after it lost contact with McMurdo Station. And finally, when the flight was scheduled to run out of fuel, there was not a single sign of it. The flight was now considered lost. Finally, the next morning, the U.S. Navy dispatched a rescue effort to locate the whereabouts of the flight, and found the remains of it on the site of Mount Erebus with all 257 people aboard dead. The wreckage impact covered a total area of roughly 570 by 120 meters, and after deep inspection of the potential survivability of such a crash, professionals deemed it as entirely unsurvivable. Regardless, there would still be one big problem. How were they going to recover this plane? It was sitting in the middle of an Antarctic volcano in harsh conditions. Recovery in and of itself would be a very difficult task, let alone the harsh weather and identification of the people. Regardless, however, the morning after the plane crashed, a search effort called Operation Overdue was set in place for the recovery of all 257 people aboard. However, this would not be easy, as they were on Mount Erebus. The weather was harsh, and extensive and heavy work like this would be much more difficult. Nonetheless, a large group of police, dentists, pathologists, and more set out for the mountain to hopefully recover and identify all 257 passengers lost upon impact. Jim Morgan, the lead inspector of the mortuary team, noted that they spent weeks in polar tents amidst the wreckage and dead bodies, struggling through the harsh environment. He noted that the skewa gulls there would try to consume the remains of the wreckage and the dead bodies, right in front of the team, and that shooing the gulls was impossible and made it significantly harder to recover the remains before the birds got to them. But eventually, throughout the weeks, they would push through the harsh environments and do everything they could. Fortunately, the rescue effort was astonishingly successful, and ended up with 83% of the remains being found. The teams that led the search effort for this wreckage were undoubtedly heroes that risked their lives to the very highest degree upon respect for the families of the victims. Those that were involved were awarded a medal of special service by the Queen of New Zealand. However, for most, there was still a massive problem with this crash. Throughout New Zealand, most would wonder exactly what went wrong. Questions about why it crashed circled the media and confused many for a while. The crash itself was infamous in New Zealand because of the fact that it seemed like everyone in the country knew a person or two that died in the plane crash. So finally, after the crash and all the search efforts, a controversial official accident report was given to the public. It was compiled by the New Zealand's Chief Inspector of Air Accidents, Ron Chippendale. Now originally, Chippendale agreed with the idea that the plane crashed due to the whiteout and thick clouds. However, upon seeing this image from one of the passengers' cameras five minutes before the flight crashed, he would reject this theory. Chippendale subsequently attributed that the actual real reason of the crash into Mount Erebus was actually due to pilot error. His arguments of pilot error was based on three main points. One, that the change over Mount Erebus did not actually mislead the crew. Two, that the crash was caused by descending below the minimum flight height, which was 6,000 feet. And three, that the crew was not certain of their position and kept moving forward regardless of not knowing where they were. In response to the nature of this official statement, the public would be more interested. So, due to this widespread public interest of the event, the government would appoint a high court judge named Peter Mahone to further investigate the causes of the crash. Mahone would essentially entirely dissect Chippendale's report. Judge Mahone would further try to prove that the reason for the crash wasn't the pilots, but instead the reason was the mistake that the airline officials who programmed the plane made. Mahone's argument of airline error was based on three main points. One, the airline officer's mistake of setting it back over Mount Erebus. Two, the lack of communication in telling the crew of the change. And three, the fact that the flight crews were never warned of the dangerous effects of the whiteout and the fact that the flight briefing before contained a number of mistakes. Ultimately, Judge Mahone would controversially accuse the airline for attempting to cover up the disaster and for disposal of evidence. He would famously say, quote, I am forced to reluctantly say that I had to listen to an orchestrated litany of lies. Ultimately, the airline took Judge Mahone to court, where the high court would not disagree with Mahone's main points of airline error, but instead found that Mahone acted in excess of his jurisdiction. 
Disappointed after this entire situation, Mahone resigned. At this point, with everything said and done, no amount of court hearings and blame pudding would prevent the crash from happening. In 1979, O'Leary would go on record saying, quote, that no one knows what the future in Antarctica holds, but aircraft and aviation will be intertwined with that future, tempered and balanced by the hardy souls of pilots and crewmen who challenge Antarctica constantly. This quote was one month before the disaster happened. New Zealand itself holds a close relationship with Antarctica. It is described by some as, quote, our backyard. And undoubtedly, the amount of deaths would mean that no New Zealanders would escape this tragedy. When the original Antarctic sightseeing flights began as a cool way to explore the one area on Earth that humans shouldn't be in, it was undoubtedly a risk. A risk that was, quote, glazed over with a glass of champagne and breathtaking views. Antarctica itself is a place that demands extensive knowledge, experience, and respect for the continent. The passengers of Flight 901 sightseeing flight unfortunately lost their lives in the face of adventure, but they also attributed a massive change in airline safety, a change that will undoubtedly be the reason that millions of others today will be safe on planes. And for that, they can rest peacefully. 